so hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Alexandre Banquet. I work as a data scientist for the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. Um, so my, my apologize if you hear some background noise, there is just some construction work in my building, so I hope this won't impact too much uh, the presentation, but let me know if it's, uh, if it's a problem for you. Uh, so as uh, Jean-Charles said, uh, I will pre my, my presentation will be divided into two parts. So the in the first part, I will uh, present uh, a recent OECD study that we uh, worked on with colleagues uh, on the donut effect and the impact of uh, remote work on um, and COVID on the new geography of housing demand. So the focus is more on uh, OECD countries and not uh, really on uh, emerging markets and uh, developing economies. And so that's why the second part uh, will be more focused on these uh, countries uh, and on the use of uh, observation data and data sets derived from satellite imagery uh, to provide some stylized facts on the evolution of built up area and demographic uh, and demography uh, in these countries. So let's begin with the first uh, part of the presentation. So it's um, a joint project we've been doing with uh, colleagues from the uh, Statistics and Data uh, Directorate and the Economics Directorate here at the OECD. Um, so we wanted to address uh, different research questions. Uh, so in the first uh, step, uh, focus on the donut effect to see if uh, OECD large metropolitan areas really experienced a donut effect in housing, uh, I mean in home ownership demand, uh, because we really focused on the um, uh, on housing transactions and not on the rental market, and uh, also look at the local drivers. And then in the second step, so the work I will present today, um, what, what is, um, uh, I mean, the, the demand also expand beyond the metropolitan boundaries, so um, beyond what we call the, the functional urban areas. So to, to do this project, uh, we relied on the network of both uh, public and uh, private uh, data sets uh, covering 16 countries at a very granular level, so both geographically and um, temporally. Uh, so we have quarterly data at uh, what we call small area unit levels, so it's size of municipalities or zip codes depending on the country. So here you can see the list of uh, all countries and of um, and the data sources. So first on, on the um, donut effect, we noticed a small but still significant donut effect within the boundaries of large metropolitan areas. So on this chart, you see the, the average house price uh, expressed in deviation from the metropolitan area average. And on the X axis, the distance to the city center. So before the pandemic, uh, you can see there was a steep decline um, with the increased uh, distance to city centers. So this is what we call a negative house price gradient. And after the pandemic, this uh, gradient became um, flatter. And, um, um, and so, uh, yeah, we, this is the donut effect that we, we noticed. Uh, so a higher um, home ownership demand uh, in the, um, where when you move away from the city centers. And then we wanted to see if uh, actually we couldn't see that uh, not only within functional urban area, but also beyond. Um, so here you can see the map of uh, Greater New, New York, metro, uh, so the metropolitan area of uh, New York, and it's showing the price changes from the first semester of 2019 to uh, first semester of 2021. Um, so, so to address this research question, we looked at uh, concentric buffers around um, uh, so these large metropolitan areas. So these are metros of more than 1.5 million inhabitants. And we also took the largest one uh, in some countries uh, where we didn't, uh, I mean, so for example, Helsinki or Oslo, which have a slightly lower population. Um, and so as you can see on this map, uh, the, the house price change was quite stable in the city. So the blue area that you can see. But when you move to the commuting zone, you get a much higher increase and even uh, higher when you go to the buffers. Um, so what we did is that, is that we regressed uh, house price changes uh, so at the local level. Um, 
and um, we 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 regress that uh, com by comparing to dummies for the com commuting zone and the buffers, and uh, by also con controlling for the for the metropolitan area, and we tested different periods. So here's the equation that um, that we we looked at. Um, so in terms of results, this is what we get. Uh, so here is showing on this chart the price growth uh, differential uh, in percentage points uh, from uh, for different periods. So you have a pre-COVID period, 2018, 2019, then the first year of COVID and second year of COVID. And um, so it, the, the reference group uh, in this case is uh, the, the city center. And as you can see, um, when uh, COVID hit, um, you can see that the the the, the price uh, differential um, was much higher uh, in the um, in the commuting zone, and uh, you have this uh, this decreasing trend then with the buffers. So uh, there was a clearly a, um, so so yeah, the, the, you can clearly see uh, this trend. But then we wanted to to go further and uh, also see uh, within um, each ring, so the commuting zone, buffer one, buffer two, uh, who, what type of settlement uh, was experienced a higher housing demand. So we classified uh, local units uh, according to their degree of urbanization. So is it a rural area, a town, or a city? Uh, using the, um, the the UN and the uh, GRC definition of uh, degree of urbanization, and for each ring, we again regress the uh, house price uh, change uh, on the year by on the year to year level, uh, and compare this to the dummies for rural areas, um, uh, for rural areas, uh, cities, uh, by taking so the, the towns as a as a control, uh, as a reference group. Um, and so what we saw uh, is that uh, in the commuting zone, uh, it's mostly the rural areas that uh, gained uh, um, attractiveness uh, with uh, COVID. And when you move to the buffers, uh, first buffer, you get uh, both cities and rural areas. And then when you move to the second buffer, it's really the cities, so more secondary cities that gained uh, attractiveness. Uh, so, so this really shows us uh, that with uh, the, 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 the with remote work, uh, there was a higher home ownership demand um, in places that basically combined the benefits of rural and urban life. So, as a rural areas located in commuting zones, and when shifting away from the metropolitan areas, uh, the large metropolitan areas, it was more the uh, so first the cities and rural areas, and then the the cities only. Um, so, so so to conclude on that uh, first part of the presentation, so as I, as I was saying, uh, we have a faster house price increase uh, outside metropolitan centers, which in areas that are also beyond uh, metropolitan boundaries, and it's not only uh, an intra metro uh, trend. And um, and concerning the, the shift in home ownership demand uh, in these uh, extended metropolitan areas, it's really the places that uh, combine the benefits of both rural and urban life. So either the low density and affordable settlements uh, in the commuting zones or the uh, cities uh, in the buffer. So if you're interested in, in uh, reading more on this uh, set of studies, so it's not only uh, one study, but in total we are, we've been working on three studies, and we plan to, to work on another one uh, the coming year by looking at more um, local factors underlying housing demands, such as uh, access, access to, to services or transport, um, transport networks. Uh, so you can have a look at the different uh, publications. So now I will move to the second part of the presentation, more focused on the um, emerging and developing economies and how uh, we can uh, leverage Earth observation data to provide insights on how the built up environment is evolving uh, in emerging markets and uh, developing economies. So um, emerging 
and developing economies have seen a, a very rapid uh, urbanization uh, over the past uh, decades. Um, and it's very important to 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 monitor uh, with the barriers, uh, not only in uh, emerging markets, but also in developed um, in advanced economies. Uh, so, so first, uh, on an economic perspective, uh, it can provide um, uh, indicators on the dwelling stock, on uh, local signals of um, of um, business creation, or this, these kind of things. But also, uh, it's important to monitor that uh, to assess the environmental impacts of urbanization, uh, because it contributes to, to deforestation, the loss of carbon sinks, uh, loss of biodiversity, and it's getting um, more and more uh, attention. Uh, and so, for example, countries that have already very high level of uh, built up surface per capita or thinking of um, implementing uh, measures to limit this uh, un unregulated expansion. Um, for example, the, the net zero land tech uh, policies that the EU is pushing and that, uh, for example, France has been um, implementing since uh, last year. So it's um, the US observation data really provide uh, interesting insights uh, and real time insights on how the, the built environment is uh, evolving. And so, um, well, we, you already saw in the previous presentations that now we have a, a large, uh, a large range of satellite imagery data publicly available. Uh, but it's important to know that it wasn't the case for for a while, and um, it's really a uh, Thanks to the, the, the public release of uh, Landsat images in 2008 uh, and then the Sentinel uh, data in 2015 and so on, that really made things um, easier and uh, also the the, uh, the capacity that we have to, to use AI models to uh, fully process uh, automatically these new types of data uh, provi is providing um, very, uh, very rich uh, insights on the built environment. So to give you um, two examples of data sets that are publicly available and that are based on satellite imagery data, and that gives you uh, indicators on, um, on the built environment. Uh, so you have uh, the Global Human Settlement Layer, GHSL, that was developed by the Joint Research Center uh, that we'll be focusing on today. And the second one that you can have, uh, that, that you can look at is Dynamic World that was developed by the World Resources Institute and Google. So they are, they are both based on uh, either uh, Sentinel or Landsat data. Um, and uh, what's great with JHSL that we look at today is that it provides data on uh, the building surface, uh, so the, the imprint, on, imprint on land of buildings, but also building aid, building volume, and it, li it links well to the previous presentation. Um, that you had. Um, and also it provides uh, data every five years si since 1975, and it also provides projections till 2030. So we'll be looking at that uh, today, and uh, we'll uh, provide uh, some um, key statistics on uh, what it's revealing about um, built up uh, areas in emerging markets. So here you see uh, how the data set looks like uh, on Brussels in Belgium. So it gives you the, so the total built up surface, but you get also, uh, you can also disentangle what's residential from what's non residential. And you also get data on building height. Um, so, what does it tell us? So when you compute, uh, so, so built up area surface, uh, built up surface per capita. Um, so this chart shows uh, the built-up surface per capita level by country and country groups. Uh, so I just cover, I'm just covering um, the, the main emerging markets and the main country groups, not only emerging but also OECD, European Union, G7, G20, advanced economies. And as you can see, the, 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 there is a huge gap between um, uh, the level of built-up sur surface per capita in advanced economies which is uh, close to 130 square meter per capita for the total surface. And uh, in emerging in emerging markets and in developing economies, uh, it's almost uh, 2.8 times lower than in advanced economies. 
And uh, even across uh, emerging markets, you see uh, large disparities. For example, in India, it's close to 25 square meters per capita. And when you go to South Africa, it's more than one, almost 110. Um, so, so this is for the whole uh, country. Um, but you can also look at uh, metropolitan area by metropolitan area level. Uh, so you, you may be aware that uh, the OECD together with the EU developed this uh, concept of uh, functional urban areas. So it's based on, um, um, uh, it was uh, only available for European and OECD countries, but we, we also developed uh, estimates for the whole world uh, to give, um, uh, so it provides a um, estimate of metropolitan areas around the planet. And so that's the level of uh, aggregation that uh, you're seeing on this map. And uh, so when you look at the built up surface per capita across countries, you can see that um, so mostly OECD countries uh, uh, and advanced economies have a much higher level of built up surface per capita. So mostly the US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, they, they have the highest uh, level of built-up surface per capita, around 160, 170. Uh, and in Europe, so France is actually really high. Uh, it's the second country after Lithuania, uh, but you also have Japan. Uh, but across OEC countries, you also have um, countries with much lower level of built-up surface per capita, such as Colombia, Turkey, who, who are which are closer to 30 square meters per capita. Um, so, so, so you can see that emerging markets and uh, developing economies have a much uh, lower level, uh, almost everywhere except uh, in some cases in, in South Africa here. Um, so now let's look at the evolution over time of the build-up surface and also other parameters, especially the population growth. So if um, population growth is, is uh, lower than the bit of surface growth, it means that um, countries tend to sprawl more and they're not moving towards uh, densification compaction. Um, and so you can see in all country groups and um, in all emerging markets, we can clearly see this trend of uh, much higher built up surface growth and population growth. Um, and the emerging markets and developing economies record, record, record much higher uh, build-up expansion than advanced economies, uh, especially uh, countries like India, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, uh, which record uh, almost uh, over the past 10, 10 years, it has increased by almost 30, 35 percent. Um, whereas in G7 countries, advanced economies, it's more, it's closer to 10 percent. Um, so, on average, uh, in the world, uh, in the past 10 years, it has increased by, by 22 percent. So, to, to give uh, an estimate of what this means, concretely, this is 82,000 square kilometers, uh, additional square kilometers, which is roughly the area of Austria. So, the whole area of the country of Austria has been built over the past 10 years. Um, and so, in, um, yeah, in, in I think I've said uh, everything on that. So again, if you look at the maps of uh, individual metropolitan areas, you can clearly see this trend where emerging markets and uh, so some emerging markets are really driving the built up surface growth uh, worldwide. So in, in China, India, uh, Turkey, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in uh, Central America. Um, <coughs> so uh, for example, in China, uh, built up surface in metropolitan areas has increased by, by more than 30 percent, uh, in India by 24 percent. By comparison, in France and the US, it increased by only 11 percent. Um, and so in terms of population, uh, an interesting thing that uh, we have been also seeing over the past 10 years is that um, uh, in in many uh, metropolitan areas located in southern Europe, Eastern Europe, um, and also in Japan, uh, the, the metropolitan areas have actually started to shrink. Uh, so in almost one third of metropolitan areas, uh, population has started to decline. 
Um, and it's mostly the case for, I'm sorry, it's mostly the case for, for small uh, metropolitan areas, so less than 100,000 inhabitants. So basically 38% of the small metropolitan areas have declined. And when you look at the large metros of more than 1.5 million inhabitants, only 1% has declined. So it's really a, a problem for, for small metropolitan areas. And now uh, we can also look at what will happen in the next 10 years. Um, so it's 2030. And uh, this uh, trend will continue in uh, emerging markets and, and uh, especially in some countries, India, Nigeria, uh, which will uh, have a very high level of uh, built up surface growth, but also population growth, especially in Nigeria. Um, although in some countries, uh, the, the, so, so in, in some countries, uh, the population is expected to peak in the coming decade. This is the case for the EU and also China. Uh, for example, the EU's population is projected to peak at uh, 453 million people in 2026. Um, and here again is a uh, so projection, built up surface growth projection. So you can clearly see it's uh, concentrated in Nigeria, India, and some, part, some parts of China. And regarding population trend, uh, the, the most driver, the main driver of uh, population. Uh, Growth will be uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and some parts of India. Mm. Um, so well, to conclude, uh, Earth observation uh, can really offer a really powerful tool to monitor built up areas uh, in emerging markets and across the globe in general. We've seen an unprecedented built up expansion in uh, many emerging and developing economies. But Earth observation data don't provide uh, everything. It's very important to complement them with other statistics uh, coming from census uh, to get uh, population counts, characteristic of the built environment, typically occupancy rates. Um, you really need to complement such observation measurements with other factors to get the full picture. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you have any question. Thanks a lot, Alexandre. Are there questions from the audience? If not, I have at least two questions. The, the first one is when you refer to, let's say, to the, to the fact that you are following surfaces, do you mean surfaces on the ground or surfaces including the, let's say, the, the eight? Because you said that uh, the, one of the two sources, you have the volume on the eight of the, the buildings in the GRC uh, source, the GHSL. Uh, so when you talk about surfaces, is it only surfaces on the ground or total surfaces, including if you have some uh, several floors? So it's really the, the surface on the ground. Uh, on the ground, the, okay. Uh, basically, you, you have different data sets in the GHSL product and uh, it's built up volume that you need to look at if you want to see uh, how volume has changed uh, over time. Uh, yeah, okay. it's a different uh, data set. Okay, so the, that was the first question. The second question is, how long do you have to wait to get the, this data, which are every five years? So it, it depends. Um, basically, um, the previous edition of GHSL didn't include the projection part. So 2025, mm -hmm. 2030 is relatively new. And it was only focusing on built up uh, surface. Uh, we didn't have the volume and um, and the height of buildings. Uh, so in general, they update every two years uh, that product, and they release it uh, quite uh, frequently. But mm. um, I, I'm not really aware of the next uh, release, to be honest. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, interesting, because indeed it gives a full picture on all the countries, and the, the dynamic aspect is uh, very interesting and sometimes even striking. Uh, I didn't have in mind that in India, the, the let's say the ratio of uh, non-residential uh, land was so low. I thought that it would be higher, but uh, OK. And uh, interesting insight also for developing countries, Nigeria or other countries. Uh, it's uh, quite interesting to see how things are moving. OK, if there are not any other questions, then I think it's the time for a break and to thank Alexandre and all the other presenters for all these uh, excellent and uh, very complimentary presentations. So we're going to take a break until, let's say, uh, five to um, five to five, uh, let's say for uh, five minutes, uh, because we have uh, still uh, rich presentations to come. 
uh, five presentations, so we'll try to stick uh, more or less to the timetable. Uh, so uh, we come back in five minutes uh, for, let's say, a more methodological part, but uh, that is also going to be very fruitful. So there will be methodology and also presentation of databases that can be shared, uh, part of them, uh, to make uh, research studies and so on. So um, it's going also to be uh, quite rich. And so uh, we come back in five minutes. Thank you.